We are thrilled to kick off the Smart Water and Wastewater keynote that we're going to cover this afternoon with Catherine Szczynski from Austin Water. She's an engineer and we're delighted to have her here. So Catherine, please join. Thank you everyone. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for being here. Um, before I delve into the specifics of Austin's on-site water reuse project, I wanted to give a little bit of a background on the water utility that I work for and just kind of provide some, some context into um, the significance of this particular pilot project and um, really highlight how this is a, um, this project is um, symbolic of a shift in kind of the perspective of the water utility and how we're um, looking forward to um, alternative water management um, approaches uh, when you're comparing that to sort of the, the traditional centralized utility approach that has existed for about the past 100 years or so. Um, and so Austin Water is what we would consider a large utility um, here in, in central Texas. We provide water and wastewater and, and reclaimed water service to about a million customers. Um, we have about 1,200 employees a budget, annual budget, over $600 million. And every day we treat about 150 million gallons of water, drinking water, um, as I mentioned in our kind of centralized utility um, systems. And so what that looks like is we have our core water supplies coming from the Colorado River and the Highland Lakes. And we have um, three drinking water treatment plants, and that's where we're treating that 150 million gallons or so, kind of fluctuates throughout the year. Um, and we, after we treat that, we pipe it through uh, the you know, distribution network to everyone's homes underneath the ground. Most people don't even know that those pipes are there or really have uh, ever thought about what ha where their water comes from when they turn the faucet on. And most of that water is, you know, that water is either consumed for drinking water purposes or maybe you irrigate your lawn and, or you evaporate in a cooling tower, but the majority of it is actually returned back into another set of pipes that flow downstream to other centralized treatment facilities for return and discharge back to that same river that uh, it was extracted from. And so just wanted to highlight that is that, you know, for the past 100 years, that's the water utility model, and that's kind of how we, you know, we'll provide the water and wastewater and now reclaimed water service, and you don't have to worry about it. Just turn on your taps and everything's fine. And those systems have been very reliable. They've improved the environmental um, kind of water quality, and um, you know, they've, they've served us well for the past 100 years, but now, um, when we are facing uh, certain drivers such as drought. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in this room remember the recent historic drought from 2008 to 2016, and now maybe we're currently in our next drought already. Um, that uh, This photo is from uh, Lake Travis, which is where one of our uh, drinking water treatment plants uh, extracts from. It's a very sad photo. I think we all remember this, what this looked like back in 2011. Um, but that, that period, that uh, you know, drought and um, these kind of extreme weather events that are becoming the norm now are really one of the main drivers driving the city to adopt an integrated water management plan and approach for um, the next 100 years. And so that plan is called the Water Forward Plan. It was developed over a period of three years, adopted by the city council at the end of 2018. And during the planning process, we evaluated a number of water supply and water demand management strategies and selected those that aligned best with the community values and those became part of our plan moving forward. And um, right after the plan was adopted, we got further council direction that we should really focus first on implementing the conservation and reuse strategies within the plan um, before we go and look for new water supplies. And this is just a, a graphic highlighting that there are kind of two buckets of strategies from that water supply plan that we um, uh, 
are delineating. The first on the left is the demand management strategies, and these are strategies that happen at the lot scale or at the building scale, and it's looking at improving water efficiency in, uh, you know, at a kind of hyper-local scale. So you have things like advanced metering infrastructure that will give you real-time data and help you identify leaks in a much quicker manner than you have been able to in the past. Looking at things like um, landscape transformation ordinances and irrigation, irrigation efficiency programs just to make you uh, use water uh, more efficiently within your property. And then on the other side, we have supply strategies that are more of like public works, big, you know, centralized utility type projects. We still have those, those are still important. Um, those include things like off for storage and recovery and expanding our centralized reclaim distribution network. But then straddling both of those uh, categories are what we call our decentralized strategies. And those involved um, collection of alternative water supplies recognizing that buildings and developments themselves can be generators of their own water supply. So when it rains, you can collect precipitation from your roof and store it for a time when it's not raining. Uh, you can do the same thing with gray water and black water within your building drains, just kind of diverting that water, um, putting it through a treatment system on site, and then reusing it on your property. So you're generating a new kind of water supply that wasn't there before, but then you're also reducing the amount of drinking water that your building needs on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's why it kind of didn't fall into either category. This uh, approach to water management is also called the fit for purpose water. And um, it's just, again, recognizing that we don't really need to use drinking water for things like toilet flushing and irrigation and, and evaporation in your cooling tower we can use these alternative water sources. And so in the water forward plan, we wanna see a shift over time of using drinking water only for drinking water needs, and then these alternative supplies will be used for non-potable needs. And that is, um, I kind of just wanna stop and like underscore that that's a big, a big shift for a centralized utility, because now we're asking individual buildings and new development projects to basically be providing a portion of their own water, whereas before the utility would be providing all of it. And so um, we have these pretty uh, ambition goal, ambitious goals within the, the Water Forward Plan. We're looking at, uh, you know, if you sum that all up, almost 10 million gallons per day of new water supplies from rainwater and gray water and, and condensate and things like that, either in individual buildings or in development clusters or campuses and things like that. And that goal um, is, is almost the same as our, our goal for the centralized reclaim system of building that out. So we're really putting as much emphasis on these on-site systems as we are on expanding our own kind of centralized reclaimed water pipe network. Um, and so that will result at, you know, full-scale implementation. This is going to be hundreds of systems spread all across the city that are basically generating their own water, having little water recycling plants within their building, um, maybe outdoors or in the basement of their building. And um, that's sort of the strategy at a high level. But how we envision implementing the, this on-site reuse, basically, program across the city is through a series of alternative water ordinances and incentives. And so we, you know, I mentioned it a couple times already that this is kind of a new paradigm shift for a centralized water utility. We're basically starting from scratch. We have to come up with a, you know, regulatory framework, figure out who's gonna be required to do this, how much water they're gonna be required to collect and what they're gonna be able to use it for. And so, you know, even before the Water Forward Plan was adopted, we already kind of got started working on the strategy because we knew it was going to be part of our overall water supply plan. Um, back in 2017, we put some money into our CIP plan, our Capital Improvement Project plan, to uh, fund this pilot project that I'll be talking about for the rest of the presentation. Um, and we wanted to do that because we needed to sort of, before we go and ask other building owners to be able to do on-site reuse in their buildings, we wanted to kind of test out what it would look like for ourselves, and that would help us um, just really move the program forward and um, just help it so there's more of a, a seamless uh, sort of integration with the current development review process. 
Um, and so we you know, began uh, commissioning our, our pilot project in 2020, and due to some delays from the pandemic that I'll discuss a little bit later, um, it wasn't actually fully commissioned until just May of this year. Um, but this project has been in the works for a while at the same time that we're developing our local program for on-site reuse. And that program is uh, basically a phased approach to starting with voluntary implementation of these systems. We have an incentive that we're offering right now to encourage early adopters of these systems before the program becomes mandatory at the end of 2023 for large development projects. So if you're a, a development project that's, that's 250,000 square feet or greater, multifamily commercial mixed use, you're gonna to have to install one of these on-site reuse systems. And so the goals for our pilot project, before we even knew where uh, this project was gonna be, uh, or the, the details, we started out with these more high-level goals of what we wanted the project to achieve. And so first and foremost, we wanted to gain our own experience with decentralized reuse and figure out what it would cost to you know, construct, install, and maintain a system like this in the long term. We're obviously looking for a water supply offset and augmentation. We want this to contribute, contribute to our water supply plan. We're looking for uh, appropriate technologies to test out and um, also looking at how to develop the criteria for the local ordinance and program and specifics of design requirements and, and certain things that we would include in our ordinance. We wanted to stretch our business model. Uh, you know, we already have a, 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 a sound utility business model that charges users for connection and use of our system and our water supply. Um, but how would that change now that some of our customers will be bringing their own water supply with them? Um, and then we were looking for opportunities for education and community outreach to be able to kind of showcase this uh, project and to showcase our you know, sustainability initiatives and um, our adaptive utility management, which are kind of our, our effective utility management goals within our own um, utility. And so we found the perfect site for this pilot project. It was very uh, fortunate, the timing aligned, that the city was building a new permitting and development center, and this was in the works, you know, at the same time that we were looking for a pilot project. And this building, um, it opened in 2020, mostly for the, again, the pandemic was ongoing, and so there were some delayed starts, and the building was finished construction in 2020, but people really haven't, started to occupy the building until just this year um, in any sort of like significant members numbers. Um, it's a 260,000 square foot building, so it kind of meets that threshold for what a large development project is. And it's designed to office um, up to 1,000 city personnel involved in the planning and development processes for the city of Austin. And so we thought it was a perfect location because again, pre-pandemic, that's where people physically came in to go get their p permits to build their development projects. And when you walk into the site, you have to walk right by these reuse systems. There are signs within the property kind of highlighting that there's um, reuse projects going on. You can get information about them. Um, and so it was just like a perfect place to demonstrate to the development community how you could do this in your own building. The building is located in the Highland Park redevelopment. I think you all remember the old Highland Mall that is now being redeveloped into a much denser um, mixed-use development. ACC is kind of the hub tenant, and they're working with a private developer to uh, develop out the rest of the site. And we're block seven there. That's just generically marked as office. That's where the new permitting development center is. And you'll notice from the map, it's a, an urban redevelopment just north of downtown. And so it's very much our centralized water and sewer network is there and available to, to the project should it need it as a backup. Just some details about the, the project. There's actually two separate reuse systems on this site. The first is the Blackwater system. Um, that collects all of the wastewater from the building and treats it through advanced, an advanced membrane treatment system that I'll show you in a, uh, another slide. And that water is recycled back through the building for toilet flushing and urinal use. And so we call it a closed loop uh, black water treatment system. And then there's a, another system that's collecting the rainwater and AC condensate and using that for ir uh, irrigating the landscape and there's also a decorative fountain on site. 
The black water system can treat up to 5,000 gallons per day of wastewater, and the two systems combined are expected to save over a million gallons of water uh, per year on this site. And compared to a typical building, they should use 75% less drinking water with these two reuse systems. The system costs 1.7 million for the black water system and also the dual uh, plumbing to get the separate non-potable supply to the toilets. And the rainwater system was $625,000 and that's you know, the cost of designing and installing and, and from, from start to finish. The O&M costs are still to be determined because they've you know, just been, been started and commissioned. Um, and in ter terms of the own ownership and operation, Austin Water owns the Blackwater Reuse System and the, another city department owns the building and their um, property manager that they contract with is operating the rainwater system. So in terms of meeting our goals for this pilot project, we are definitely gaining experience with decentralized reuse and figuring out all of the various regulations that are um, applied to projects like these. Uh, we were successfully able to get this Blackwater reuse uh, system permitted. We made it through the, the state's permitting process when, you know, starting from the first conversation, with, with, which was, why would you want to do this? The sewer is right there. You can just send your wastewater to the treatment plant. Um, and sort of similar comments from the city reviewers they were more like, what is this? What am I looking at? Is it a septic system? Why do you want to do this? Um, but over uh, the series, it, there was a lot of coordination and meetings uh, with the various staff members at the state and local level. And once we were able to sit down and explain the purpose of the project and kind of the, that this is like a paradigm shift and we're kind of getting prepared for more buildings to be doing this for our water supply, people really, like clicked with them and they got it and they were sort of on board with helping to get the, the reviews and approvals approved, but making sure you know, the system was designed in a, a safe manner. Um, Blackwater reuse is definitely the most complicated uh, type of system to permit. Um, and actually there needs to be some state regulations that are changed to allow uh, private developers to be able to do this if you are if you have access to the to a already a, a publicly owned treatment works and a, a wastewater treatment plant, the only way you can reuse black water in your project is if you own that backup sewer network and treatment plant, which is for the city great. We already do that, but um, private developers do not have their own wastewater treatment plants generally, and so that's something that we are working on with the state to try and get that changed moving forward. But rainwater and gray water, that's those are pretty simple. Um, that authority to permit those systems is delegated to the city and is much more simple. In terms of supplying a water supply offset, mentioned 5,000 gallons per day is the maximum treatment capacity. And if you just, you know, I did a back of the envelope calculation. If you take that 5.72 MGD goal for 2040, for these building scale systems and divide that by 5,000 gallons per day, you would need over 1,100 of these systems to meet that goal. Some of these systems will be larger, some a little bit smaller, but again, we're expecting hundreds of these systems to be coming online in the next 20 years or so. As a technology test, uh, the, the Blackwater treatment system is employing an advanced and hybrid membrane system. There's only one other treatment system that uses this particular technology in the whole US right now. And as a water utility, a centralized water utility, we don't have any membrane treatment plants now. So our operators are learning how to operate this membrane system. It's providing tertiary treatment. We're doing nutrient removal. Um, office building wastewater has higher concentrations of wastewater strength, and so there's additional chemical treatment that needs to happen in addition to the biological and physical um, separation going on in the membrane system. Um, but these are the types of technologies that you will see within building applications because they have a small footprint, um, and they're just kind of efficient little package plug-and-play systems that you can put into either the basement or the parking garage or in our case, I don't think I showed that last slide or so. I forgot to mention that this is a photo of the Blackwater treatment system where it's located on the property in, under a walkway um, 
as you walk through the courtyard, entering the building, it's kind of tucked away. And unless you were looking for it or looking at the signs, you wouldn't even notice that it's there, you're walking over a wastewater treatment plant to get into the building. We're also testing out uh, the technology used to monitor this system. These are some screenshots of the uh, third-party vendor uh, software that's used. Our third-party vendor who is um, overseeing the kind of first two years of operation of this system, he's located in Virginia, um, and so he's monitoring everything remotely. There's lots of sensors, lots of things are being monitored from the flow rate to the the, the chlorine um, residual turbidity, the, trans, the membrane pressure, everything. There's lots of sensors in this system and lots of monitoring. In addition to this system, the booster pumps providing uh, the pressure to um, provide water to the toilets in the building are monitored by the building management sister, system and the, by the uh, facilities engineer. And then we also have the Austin Water Utility SCADA looking at the system too because our operators use a different type of system to monitor alarms and to troubleshoot and to know when to come out to make repairs. And so we're getting a lot of great data on this and kind of figuring out um, what is the best system to be able to monitor uh, this system and also what are the kind of the remote capabilities for monitoring these systems. In terms of criteria development, um, our regulations in our program going forward when this, when this program becomes mandatory, it's going to rely heavily on online, continuous online monitoring and then automatic diversion if anything is going wrong. So we're really looking at automating the kind of control of these systems and really just um, only having operators be changing things out when alarm goes off or when they're just alerted to something not measuring up right. And so this is a, a, an example treatment system for a rainwater system that's maybe used to uh, spray irrigate outside. And uh, you know, whenever you're spraying water like this, there's the potential for human contact. And so you wanna provide some treatment and that's typically looks like filtration and disinfection. And so when you're designing your system, you know, you have a, a, a cartridge filter here, but really you're wanting to um, kind of limit the turbidity of that water so that the disinfection step, which is, you know, getting rid of the bacteria in the water, is more effective. And so if you design the system and kind of set it up to operate in a certain way, then when you're operating it, you're really only monitoring turbidity and the flow rate and then the free chlorine residual. And then if an alarm goes off to say that any of those are reading um, within a range, out, outside of the range of the design, then a valve comes on and just diverts the water to, in this case, the, the storm sewer, until that water is safe to use and can come back online. And so these systems will be very much automated going forward. Um, and I wanted to point out that the, the rainwater system at the PDC was installed before we had developed this criteria. And so it doesn't really have any of these controls in place. And you know, you would think that a rainwater system is, is more simple and you don't really need to monitor it that much, but that's actually the system that's been giving us the most amount of problems because not much thought was putting in, put into the design and the controls of it. And so a lot of the time, the um, irrigation company that's responsible for using it to maintain the landscape is just coming and filling the tank with um, the city's drinking water. And so we need to go back and automate it so that it's, that sort of override function uh, doesn't happen. In terms of stretching our business model, I think I touched on this before. Again, we're having to figure out how to basically give credit to these sites that will be providing um, a portion of their own water. Normally, when you connect to the city's water and sewer system, you have to pay connection fees based on how much you intend to use the system. And so we're gonna give credit, some sort of credit to those connection fees for these projects that are providing their own water, figuring out wastewater billing. Um, for example, if you're taking rainwater and bringing it in indoors to flush your toilets, we have to figure out how to charge for that wastewater that's now entering our system that won't show up on your domestic meter. And then also figuring out how to meter these um, uh, projects properly so that we can get the data that we need. In terms of education and community outreach, we have, um, 
and develop these two little characters, which are um, kind of cute and mostly for the uh, kids' audience, but they, their acronyms help explain what the systems are doing. And so OSCAR stands for on-site collection and reuse for the rainwater and condensate. And then you have Clara, that's closed loop advanced reclaimed assembly. And they sort of give you like a, a graphical explanation of what each of those systems is designed to do. Um, in terms of sustainability and adaptive management, we really, you know, I just can't um, exaggerate the benefit of having this pilot project in a building that um, the water utility staff occupies on a day-to-day -day basis because if there are any issues, any problems, we'll know, we're some of the first people to know. And the building manager will definitely call me uh, to let me know if there's an issue. Um, and we were able to troubleshoot and kind of figure out lessons learned and, and it's really going into our, you know, taking notes on our, our uh, criteria development and our regulations for when these are mandatory and um, learning a lot as we go along. One example of that is uh, something I say we're waiting for a smart solution for. Uh, the the cross-connection testing for this project has been um, I say challenging, it's just something that we're, we're wanting to think through. Uh, you can see that's the equipment room for Clara, the Blackwater system, and there's tons of sensors and components and controls and all of that is automated. But when it, it comes to making sure the potable water supply is separate from the non-potable water supply, that's a very manual process and the typical process is that once a year you kind of shut down the building and you depressurize each of the different water systems and then repressurize them one at a time to make sure that no water is coming out of a fixture that it shouldn't. But that is a very manual and cumbersome process and if we're gonna be expecting that these systems will be in multifamily buildings as well, you can't really have people just evacuate their homes for a whole day while you check all the toilets. And so right now we've dyed the toilet water here, this blue color, um, and, and they're kind of testing that out. That could be like the ongoing continuous um, uh, monitoring process for whether or not there's a cross connection. But even still, you're like installing a dye injection system in, into this building and um, sort of jury rigged in there because it was an after the fact thing. But I don't know, maybe technology will advance at some point where we can figure out a, another way to continuously monitor if someone has connected the wrong pipe to the wrong supply. I think I just have one more slide about the future work and kind of speaking to the adaptive management. Um, for Clara, we are uh, intending to install a dedicated electric meter. One of the claims for these decentralized systems is that they are more energy efficient than, say, you know, sending the water to a faraway treatment plant and then treating it and then piping it all the way back for reuse. And so we just want to collect the data on the actual energy consumption from this type of system. For Oscar, we're gonna be installing level sensors and new controls. Uh, this will help us measure daily inputs to the, um, to the rainwater tank, what's coming in in terms of rainwater and then condensate. And then it will limit the amount of makeup water entering the collection tank. And then in terms of project accessibility, um, we're working on creating a virtual reality tour of the facility so that people don't physically have to come to the site to um, take a tour of it. Um, we're doing that for public education purposes and then also in mind that we, we could use this for staff training or future training requirements for operators of these systems moving forward. Um, and then in addition to that, we're gonna develop displays on the water savings and other met metrics and make it more of an interactive pilot project instead of just like a web page where you can go read about the project. Um, and then transferring lessons learned to private owners of these systems when they ultimately become owners and operators of their own types of systems. I think that's it. Yep. Thank you.